Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, what a wonderful pleasure for me to be asked by James Crossley to be able to take part in this um, uh, conference. Uh, in some way, the um, subject of my presentation isn't quite earth-shaking, but I think what it will add is not only an African perspective to the discussion on the Bible in politics, but more particularly my own country, Zambia, which is not very well known to most people, partly because it's, uh, we are victims of our own um, uh, peace and stability for the last 50 years. So only in the last four or five years have we had a bit of news to share with the rest of the world, and I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, about that. So by way of uh, uh, introducing um, my topic, I thought I would begin with um, a quotation from uh, Coriolanus, Scene 2, Act 3, Lines 22 to 226 to 231, uh, this particular uh, scene here is where the uh, tribune have gone to uh, the plebs to try and ask them to cast their vote on behalf of um, uh, Coriolanus. And in that process, they say that if for any reason you must do something that is totally against what you intended to do, namely, we made you against the grain to voice him counsel, lay the fault on us, meaning that you can blame it on us if things go wrong. So in some sense, my hearing or reading of the text that we are going to look at, I'm not going to blame anyone. I'm just going to blame myself. Um, by way of introduction, uh, I got this uh, headline from a book I read about four or five years ago, uh, The Late Arrival of the Post. It has nothing to do with the postman. It has to do with the fact that um, uh, post-colonial theory arrived quite late in biblical studies. And uh, thanks in large measure to this man whom I met in Birmingham, Rasia Sugitharaja, whom most of you will remember was the editor of that book, uh, Voices from the uh, uh, Margin. Um, going back again. Sorry, I've got this so completely. Uh, I was supposed to be going back, so I don't know where I'm going now. <laughs> Maybe I might get there eventually. Now, let me begin here, because this is a good place to begin. I want to uh, contextualize what I'm going to discuss with you from an African or Zambian uh, perspective. And I have entitled that perspective as a Zambian context for obeying the powers that be. Um, just a little bit of background about Zambia. Zambia was a British colony up to um, October 24th, 1964. So it's been independent since then. But what that means is that even up to today, most of our laws and regulations, etc., do bear a certain colonial legacy. And therefore, when I was doing my PhD, because I was studying the area where my parents came from, a post-colonial theory uh, was very much the natural thing for me to do. Now, this is a picture now, not many of you would recognize this man in the center there. His name is Edgar Lungu. Now, Edgar Lungu is the current president of Zambia. He is the sixth president since 1964. So we haven't done too badly. Um, he and I, in some sense, crossed paths a long, long time ago. When I went to secondary school, 
1971, a long time ago, he and I went to the same school. Uh, we never knew each other and we still don't know each other. The reason why I put him there is to foreground part of the discussion that I'm going to, uh, um, uh, uh, to give to you. That by and large, Zambia has been a very peaceful, quiet, democratic state. But around about 1991, um, Zambia decided to change its constitution. And part of the change in the constitution in the preamble was to include a clause that declared Zambia a Christian nation. Now, most Christians thought this was a great idea. But there were some of us, even though we are Christians, we were very worried why politicians would be interested in um, enshrining the Christianity of a country in its uh, constitution. My guess was that one of the ways of shutting people up is by using the Bible. So if you can say to people who are trying to object to your policies, to say, after all, we are Christians, and the Bible says X, depending who decides what the Bible says. Uh, this um, man here has continued the uh, same policies. Now, recently, the bishops of Zambia wrote a pastoral letter to all the Christians and non-Christians in Zambia, warning about how slowly Zambia is descending into a dictatorship. And all that discussion has come under uh, my good friend um, uh, Edgar. Now, I'll show you a picture of another man connected with uh, Zambian politics. There he is in red. Um, his, his name is Hakainde. It's a local name. He is the leader of the opposition. And in some sense, he demonstrates how one can relate to a text such as the one we are going to look at and disagree with its basic interpretation as supporting what the state does. And just to give you a little bit of a background, in that uh, photo there, he has just been arrested by the police. So in the last seven or eight weeks, and he has been charged with uh, treason. And um, part of the charge of treason would make any court in any place laugh. Um, he was arrested when he and the president were invited to the same ceremony, uh, traditional ceremony. Uh, his entourage was the first one to go, and the president's entourage was coming behind. Now, there is a law, like in most countries, if the president is using that part of um, uh, the road, the police outriders would go ahead and tell everyone to go aside to let the president pass. He refused. He said, I'm actually the one who was legitimately um, elected by the people. This guy is an imposter. And there was a bit of a standoff in the process. In the process, the president's entourage decided to overtake him and then go wherever they were supposed to go. A day later, he was arrested. And that's him there in front of the police station. And the charge is treason. I started a debate on Facebook trying to discuss whether um, blocking the president's entourage constitutes treason. Half of my respondents said, of course, it's clear. He put the life of the president in danger so that he will become president. And then I asked, is that sufficient to constitute intent to depose someone if you simply say, no, I'm not going to give way. So the other half said, no, 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 it's just a traffic offense. He should have just been taken in and told, listen, don't do that again, or pay a few extra pounds. So anyway, he is still in custody, awaiting uh, trial. 
my guess is that I don't think the trial will go anywhere. If anything, the government has given him the, the platform for winning the next elections, not that I support him. Um, what I'm proposing is that the famous text we have from um, Romans chapter 13 can be read against the grain. And I suggest that post-colonial theory is probably the best perspective from, uh, from which to um, uh, do that kind of reading or hearing the text. Unfortunately, the bit I wanted to emphasize there in red isn't quite so visible if you are at the back of the room. Um, the bit I wanted to emphasize there is uh, Robert Young speaks about insurgent knowledges that come from the subaltern, the dispossessed, and that they seek to change the terms and values under which we all live. So I'm suggesting that the text of Romans chapter 13, which has always been read as simply saying, whether you like it or not, once somebody has been put in power, you have to obey them. I'm suggesting that if you are coming from this perspective of insurgent knowledges, perhaps there is a different way of reading uh, that text. I thought this would also be an occasion for me to pay tribute to somebody who inspired me to do post-colonial theory, even though the kind of writing he did was not called post-colonial theory. This is the man, his name is um, uh, Michael Pryor. Michael Pryor was a Vincentian Catholic priest. Um, he wrote a book called The Bible and Colonialism. In my view, that in some sense gave impetus to the discussion that the Bible is an ideological text and that it has been used both for good and for ill. In his case, his main focus was that um, the Israelis have abused the Bible in order to use the Bible as title deeds to the Holy Land. But when he wrote that book and sent it to the publishers, they said, mm, we're not so sure we can publish this as it stands. Why don't you include um, other places where land has been an issue regarding the Bible and how it's interpreted. And therefore, the book was expanded to include Northern Ireland, and of course he was happy being an Irishman. It also includes Latin America. It also includes uh, South Africa. So that's the man who inspired me to do this kind of uh, reading. So this is the text that um, has given so much uh, discussion. When I was doing a little bit of research, although this was the background text at the back of my mind, um, my mentor uh, said to me, if you focus on interpreting this text, you are going to spend all your research time fighting the people who have written on this text. So why don't you move the discussion? So I moved the discussion to northeastern Zambia and to how the Bible in general had been received, translated, and appropriated, and then gave only one chapter to uh, Romans chapter 13. Um, I won't go through all of it, but I'm interested in verse 1 there. Uh, let every soul be subject to the ruling authorities, for um, authority is there, the, for there is no authority except from God. And those that have been put there have been uh, established by, uh, by him. So that's the main verse that I'm going to focus on in this uh, uh, discussion. But part of my discovery when I was looking at how this text has been used, I was interested in how this text has been used, particularly in Africa. And I discovered that largely, for most people, this text means exactly what it says. And that's exactly what I'm questioning. So the first text here is from uh, an African Catholic cardinal. 
who comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. His name was um, Joseph Albert Malula. Now, Joseph Albert Malula made these remarks in 1965, just after the independence of the Democratic Republic of the Congo from uh, Belgium. And at that uh, Thanksgiving, they were giving a Thanksgiving for the end of the Second Vatican Council, the Cardinal said the following, it is for us a comfort that our government should associate with us to bend the knee in front of God. It is God who gives authority. Monsieur le Président, Mr. President, the church recognizes your authority. And this bit is where it connects with uh, Romans chapter 13, because authority comes from God. We will apply faithfully the laws which you would like to establish. Um, you can count on us um, in your efforts to establish the peace to which all, or all of us aspire so assiduously. So these words, in some sense, were read and are still read by people as confirming the state and to say whatever the state does, that's what we will um, follow. But these actually turned out to be famous last words. Not that the man died, but seven years later, when um, Cardinal Malula made a statement which opposed some of the things that President Mobutu at that time was putting in place. President Mobutu didn't like that. Because previously, after he became president, he was all very cozy and in a good relationship with the bishops because uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a very Catholic country. I would say about 85% Catholic. Um, and there was such a good relationship that at the beginning, President Mobutu decided to buy all the bishops of the Congo, Mercedes-Benz, and to build a house for them. And then Malula goes on to say, no, 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 Mr. President, I think you are getting this wrong. He was immediately surrounded by the police, and they were about to arrest him when the Vatican whisked him out of the country, and he was in exile for a month while they were negotiating how to get him back into the country. He was uh, eventually taken back into the country. So famous last words. But I quote them here in order to show how, for most people, when you read uh, Romans chapter 13, it's very straightforward. It says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And therefore, this idea of resisting what the government decides is totally out of, um, out of question. Um, the second example I'm going to give of um, hearing or reading the text with the grain that is supporting this interpretation that whatever the government does, you have to go for it, comes from um, South Africa. This long quotation here is from a book called um, It is a Beautiful Country, written by Alan Payton, a South African uh, author. Um, it's a long quotation, but I'm interested in the bit in red there where w one of the people in the, um, in the book is questioning why anybody should be defying the government. And if you remember that at the time when they were defying the government, the white government decided that it was in the right and no one else was to question it. So the guy then says, was it not Paul himself who wrote that rulers are not a terror to the good, but only to the evildoers, quoting Romans chapter 13, verse 3. So, so far, you can see that for most people, the text of Romans chapter 13 is absolutely straightforward. And I have given those examples of my friend Edgar Lungu and his nemesis, 
uh, showing that most probably, as long as they are in power, this is exactly what the text uh, means. So I'm now going to focus on the first verse there. Um, and I was delighted to hear the paper that was given on the politics of translation. Again here, the politics of translation are absolutely everywhere. And to make matters worse, it makes a huge difference in terms of the grammar, the syntax, and all those things as to how we can understand uh, uh, this. For example, the word that is used mostly in some translations to say that every person should obey the ruling authorities, hypotasso, um, there it's given as hypotasesto. Um, it's not the ordinary word in Greek for to obey. And for me, that already raises certain flags when the ordinary word in Greek to obey is hypakuo, and you avoid it there. Uh, you avoid it for a good reason. Um, but as to what it means, to, uh, for me, the word is an unusual word, obviously, uh, made out of two uh, parts, hupo, which will be the preposition, and tasso, which will be uh, the verb. But as we know, once words combine preposition and verb, sometimes they give rise to a new meaning. But when I was doing my uh, MA in Biblical Studies in Rome, we would stop at words such as that and try to pass it. And I'm sure those of you uh, with Greek background would immediately pass that as um, imperative, uh, third person, uh, singular. Um, and then you would also say, well, the ending is uh, passive. And it goes with the idea to be submissive sounds quite passive. But my question is, is that a passive or a middle? So from a post-colonial perspective, or from reading against the grain, I would say, suppose we were to read Hypotasesto as a middle rather than a passive, would, would it make any difference? I would say in terms of emphasis or nuance, probably it would, because as everybody or every student of Greek knows, um, when you use the middle voice, you actually are saying that it's somebody doing something when, to put it uh, uh, sort of in some way, when there is something in it for you, that there's a benefit somewhere for you. So I think it's saying much more than simply uh, you should obey. It's saying that you know what, it's in your best interest to be able to cooperate with these powers. But he calls them hyperechusais, which is a very difficult one to uh, translate. Now, most people, you say hyperechusais means ruling authorities. Yes, one meaning is ruling, but there is another meaning. Hyperecho, I think, also has the sense of to excel, to do well. Um, therefore, it's a different meaning if I'm told, listen, cooperate with leaders or authorities who are really trying to do their best for the common good. Um, I think that's a different meaning from, yeah, you know what, any leader who has been put, uh, put there, uh, 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 cooperate with them. So that's the bit I was passing there. And uh, the second part for me, where it says, in Romans 13, 1b, I see it as a conditional clause. And what would that mean? Here is how I would um, translate it if I was to be very liberal. And if my interest is ideological, and if I'm interested in the meaning. So this is how I would translate it. For if a particular instance of authority or government is not from God, then it ceases to have legitimacy. And by implication, it ceases to command our obedience. Now, coming back to my Zambian uh, situation, I'm increasingly getting the impression that the current president or the current 
leadership are taking us down a dangerous road and that we are going to become an undemocratic state. And um, the lack of democracy, I think, is the seed for so much um, unrest uh, in the future. Now, if I went back to Zambia, and I'm going there in July for a visit, and I hope uh, the Zambian intelligence are not listening to this, otherwise they will not welcome me at the airport. But if I was to take part in the elections in, uh, in Zambia, I don't think the uh, current leadership uh, still has legitimacy. There are so many questions, even to the way they became the current uh, leaders of uh, the country. So that would be my reading of um, um, Romans chapter 13, verse 1. There's just one thing very quickly before I uh, bring the whole discussion to a close, um, where one of the things I discovered uh, when I was doing my research, which was of great interest to me, and I know it's of great interest to my colleague uh, Chris Keith here, is that we often read the Bible, especially those of us in the West, as a written document. Of course it's a written document, but if we try to put it in its context, letters were not uh, meant to be read privately as a written document. They were an oral document. And that makes a difference. And my argument would be that while a written text has a certain um, finality about it, as one wise person once said, what I have written, I have written. Hogegrapha, gegrapza. So, uh, in some sense, the written word has been given much more than it is worth. Whereas, if a word is taken as oral, there is some fluidity to it, and that there is some negotiation that takes place in terms of appropriating meaning. And I'm also suggesting that in the letter that was read to the Romans, it was not as if photocopies had been distributed to all the Romans and says, here you go, this is what St. Paul wrote. They made sure that everybody was gathered on a particular day. And then the person who had brought the letter read it, but not just read it, interpreted the letter. Unfortunately, we don't have the interpretation that goes with it. If we had, we would actually discover that this text probably said a lot more than it does. And it's that unsaid bit that concerns me and that encourages me that perhaps if we read against the grain, we can discover a different way of appropriating um, the text. Um, one suggestion that has been made to support the fact that there is oral patterning in Romans 13 by John Harvey is that the whole letter is really suffused with um, uh, an oral ethos. And he gives an example of chapter 13, verse 2, where he quotes this, uh, this verse as showing a chiasmus. I am not very convinced about the chiasmus there, so I'll move on very quickly. But I cite this oral patterning in order to underscore that in oral cultures, whatever you hear is subject to negotiation. Subject to negotiation, sometimes purely on the meaning level. Somebody says something to you, and then you can say, sorry, I didn't catch that. Or, mm, I'm not so sure, what did you mean there? And then perhaps the person can actually refine what they are saying and say, well, that's not really what I intended to say. This is what I intended to say. But unfortunately, that stuff is lost to us. But of course, that's good news for biblical scholars because it keeps me and Chris and James Crossley and all of you in employment. <laughs> um, what I'm suggesting here is that when we read the text of um, Romans chapter 13, we are being invited to negotiate. We have to negotiate the text, just as we would negotiate when we are talking to somebody in, um, uh, in person. This for me is a good summary of what is happening in the text. 
It comes from uh, the African Bible. In some way, the African Bible is a bit of a misnomer. A group of scholars, Catholic scholars, got together round about uh, 1990 to come up with a translation of the Bible. And they realized that translation of the Bible is hard work. So they got in touch with um, uh, uh, the Americans who offered them the version, I think it's the um, NIV uh, version which they used, and then they made comments on the particular books, and they called it the African Bible. So very quickly, this is what they said. Verses 1 to 7 of chapter 13, demand obedience to what is right, not just any ruling authority, and never to what is wrong. And that is understood within the text. So Paul is certainly not encouraging blind obedience, in my view. So according to Romans 12, um, it's up to Christians to discern for themselves what the will of God is. So you cannot decide how to apply Romans chapter 13 purely on its basis. And then lastly, Paul carefully declines to legitimize either Rome or resistance to Rome. Uh, the answer is somewhere in between. Thank you very much.